everybody, welcome to a special presentation of the Captain Sip Psychedelic Show. I am joined by none other than Steve Hillish. That is right, my friends. How are you doing? You alright? I'm very good. Well, uh, just on the gong subject, obviously, um, when uh, David left, and it was at 75 when David left gong. Yes. Um, a lot of people were seeing, seeing you as, as taking over the leadership as such, and as a like, uh, it's been said there was no such leader yeah, yeah, gone. Yeah, well, it, it, yeah, exactly. That was something I found rather awkward. Even David wasn't really the leader. He was a founder. You could say he had a special position. But there's no way I could adopt that position. I wasn't the founder of God, and I didn't, I didn't develop the concept. I was an eager, eager, and equal participant in a community project. And so the idea of having a leader was a bit, a bit awkward, you know. I must confess that towards the end of '75, but McKenna and myself found gone without out David. It wasn't really doing it for us, so we, we decided, I decided to go back to my solo career. This, this last couple of years that we've been doing Gong, we did the new album 2032, uh -huh. it's been very fulfilling for me and we're really happy to be here with David and Jilly, you know. Well, Fish Rising was something I did while I was still in Gong. You're still in Gong. I with members of Gong, it was like a side yep. project, but then obviously when I left Gong at the end of 75, then that became my full occupation. And we, after the L album, we did a, a, an extensive tour of America, Steve Hitch band supporting ELO. And um, we'd, we'd meet a lot of American fans you know, after the gigs. And um, a, quite a few times we'd have sort of rather awkward discussions where um, fans were coming up to me and saying, you know, what are you listening to at the moment? So at this time, Partly due to my connections with a sound um, system company, we were really into funk. Really? Parliament Funkadelic and uh, Boots's Rubber Band and, and the side orders of Earth, Wind and Fire and things. And that, that was actually what we were listening to most of the time. This is in sort of 76, 77, early 77. So I was saying, yeah, I've, I've been listening to sort of Parliament Funkadelic and Earth, Wind and Fire, and these progressive rock fans would like have heart attacks. And Steve, <laughs> my God, you're listening to disco? I said, what do you mean disco? This is great, you know? You know, it's great, it's really good. Didn't you used to like Jimi Hendrix? And, and I say it was this strange kind of apartheid in America, in music, between sort of white stuff and black stuff. And I, I, I couldn't understand it because a lot of the UK development of rock music is based on British people reinterpreting American stuff, you know, like by being black music or white music. That's how the Stones, the Beatles, how they all started. For me, I found that quite shocking, and I thought, so I did. I'm going to try to do some more funky music. I'll try and blend my sort of quirky English style with a more funky approach. Um, well, I wanted to actually mention there that, um, that you, you obviously entered with Motivation Radio. Um, you introduced a whole kind of new, you know, it was a different sound that you were, you were getting out with that album. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I must, as you probably know, I've been involved in dance music yes, quite yes, a while. Absolutely. And I date the beginning of that process to the album Motivation Radio, yeah. which incidentally, because I've dodged it for it's called System 7, uh -huh. the, if you notice the catalogue number of Motivation Radio, V2777 on the okay. vinyl. Okay. And there's seven little spaceships on the cover, and also the tarot card number seven. So that's where System Seven comes from. That's where that, that, that yeah. kind of came from. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I mentioned, I've, I've mentioned, I read as well that um, your album Green, um, which was uh, was up, it was produced by uh, Pink Floyd's Nick Mason. Yeah, that'd be correct. What was it like um, was working with? Well, it was very educative, it was really good. I mean, we already had a connection with Nick because he uh, produced a Shamal album. Shamal, which was your last? Which was the last Gong album. I wasn't a full participant in that. I was already sort of halfway out the door. But, you know, I went to, we went to quite a few sessions and you know, we all developed a rapport with Nick. And when I heard he was interested in working on a CBD's album with me, oh yeah, I thought, great. <laughs> A few tricks. <laughs> Fantastic. No, yeah. really good. I mean, it was excellent. I mean, yes. yeah, I mean, a lot of people, 
quite a lot of people that's their favourite album I did is Greek. Green. It's a, a thing that I did, they, um, they eventually recorded on a, a live um, in the studio recording of Michael Field's Tubular Bells. Oh, that was 73? 73. That wasn't 71, that was 73. 73. How was that? How did that? Well, basically, um, when, before I played with Gong, after I stopped my first band, Khan, I played for a while with Kevin Ayers, who's an old associate of David from the Soft Machine. Yep. And I basically replaced Mike Oldfield, who was previously the guitarist with Kevin Ayers. Hey, okay. And Mike Oldfield had left to make a solo album with, with this new label started by these upstarts called Virgin, <laughs> who also, um, I developed a relationship with them, which led to my solo album, Fish Rising. And they'd also developed a relationship with Gong. And in fact, when, when I joined Gong, it was for the making of the Flying Teapot album at the Manor, which is Virgin Studio. It was in early 73. We were, we were working in the day, and Mike Oldfield was coming in in the night, so I wanted to finish off his album. And uh, when it came to, and then his record Tube of the Bells and the Gong Flying Teapot album were released more or less at the same time. And Richard Branson thought it would be really good promotion to do um, a live version of Tubular Bells and get various sort of other musicians, including some quite famous people like Mick Taylor, who was in the Rolling Stone yeah. at the time. Obviously myself and Pierre Merlin from Gorm and various other people. And um, we did it at the Queen Elizabeth Hall. And this is before everyone, everyone realised quite how successful Tubular Bells right. was going to be. Well, it was a total surprise that it was so successful. Although Richard Branson would say he wasn't surprised because he really believed it, but I think everybody was pretty surprised. Not, not the least Mike Oldfield himself. <laughs> but the concert was a big success and then um, a few months later the BBC wanted to redo it in the studio with the same people who did the live concert at the Queen of the Hall and that's basically what like, the thing that's it's now on YouTube and everything. Like, that's, that's what it is. That's, it was, that, that's what that was. It, that wasn't the first time we'd done it. That was a, a, a redoing of it. The first time we did it was at the Queen Elizabeth Hall in, I think, in June '73. Now you know. But I will say there's a Glasgow um, um, connection here. Is a couple of years later, there was a project to do orchestral tubular bells and heard its ridge. And fairly at the last minute, Mike Oldfield ducked out of it. He, he couldn't face doing it because he was um, finding fame rather hard to deal with. And Richard Branson phoned me up to deputise for him. And I actually came and did a, uh, well, I think it was at the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow with the right. Glasgow Orchestra. Um, so you, you mentioned there that Mike, Mike was, uh, couldn't handle the fame. Well, he went through a period where it was difficult. He's, I mean, you know, right. now he's, he's fine. I mean, he's really cool, you know. But it, it was a period where he, he would admit to himself he, he, it was rather difficult. <laughs> I'm actually <laughs> I'm hoping to meet with Nick Turner um, when, he, when he appears or, or whatever. But you actually um, worked with, with um, his flutes, stuff that he recorded in a pyramid. Yeah, well, that was, that was actually, this is him. Um, uh, that was actually, it was interesting, that was my first full production job. I was not working as a record producer in the 80s, but Nick's album, my first full album as a producer. And also, um, he gave me the material he would recorded in the Pyramid. It was after he left Hawking. Uh -huh. And uh, it was on cassette. And he actually, I took it out to LA when I was working with Malcolm Cecil on okay. Motivation Radio. That Malcolm himself helped me clean it up and put it on multi-track for Nick. Fantastic. And that was the beginning of the whole project. Nice really and I came back from LA with Nick's stuff on multi-track and went straight to Rockfield. And <laughs> no, Nick's a really good friend. I'm, I'm happy to be doing it. Oh, really absolutely. So working with System 7? Yeah, that's, that's, that's still my main project. And uh, in fact, um, we are, we've just started a new System 7 up, so next year it will be mainly System 7. Okay, yeah. okay and there's a new album on its way from right now. Fantastic. Okay, well that's it, we've done it. <laughs> we've done it, so Steve Hillage, thank you very much for your time.
Okay, thank you. <laughs>